Uh, Let us pray. Loving and faithful God, we give you thanks for your word. We ask that you can continue to give us insight and understanding by your Holy Spirit speaking in scripture. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, uh, the word actually just says brethren, um, but we say brothers and sisters. This is the, what's in our uh, modern translations because that included everyone. That included everyone in the community, brothers and sisters together. Paul writes, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm. In this particular section, Paul writes about two ways. There is the way of Christ, the way which is the way of the cross, the cruciform way, and he writes about those who follow that path. And then there are those who live as enemies of the cross of Christ. And I think when we hear this language, we might immediately have some kind of picture in our heads as to who we are talking about. And some of you might think that this means Christians, people who believe in Jesus, and non-Christians. And I'm here to tell you, first of all, that that's actually not right. That's wrong. This, if, if you think that way about this text, then you are essentially declaring that anyone who is not a Christian is an enemy of the cross of Christ. Actually, no. Imagine that. Imagine your neighbors and your friends, and you're going to say, you're an enemy. No, that's, that's not what this is about. And actually, what's interesting is someone might say that they follow Jesus, but they may behave in ways that are actually as an enemy of the cross of Christ. So you can't just equate those things because actually this passage is about particular behavior. It's about the way people interact, how we live in community, how we live in the same community, city, country, and world, how we live and get along with one another. Does that seem kind of important today? I think so. We are called to live in the cruciform way, the way of the cross, and to not live as an enemy of the cross of Christ. And the first thing I want you to notice is how careful Paul is about saying that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Right? He doesn't just say they're enemies of Jesus. They're enemies of him. He puts the cross at the center because the way of the cross is one of suffering, service, suffering service. It's the way of sacrifice. It's the way of love. So anytime you see something that is opposed to those things, that is an enemy. That person is behaving as an enemy of the cross of Christ. Anytime you see triumphalism without costly service, without the giving of your life without the emptying out of your power, then you are seeing something that is opposed to the cross of Christ. I remember going to a conference a long time ago where there was a pastor doing a workshop and he was talking about how, um, he was talking about starting new churches. And that's why I was at the conference because we were starting a new church at the time. And I was there to learn and he said that one of the biggest things is that people want to be on a winning team. And that as the leader, my job was to try to create, engineer a series of wins for the team. And that would create momentum. And then more people would be attracted to being on this winning team. And of course, what he was saying actually works. It does work. People do want to be on a winning team. Nobody wants to be on a losing team. But the problem is, is that there are people on the losing team. So what about them? What about the ones on a losing team? And even worse, what about when your win, and we're not talking about sports or games here, we're talking about life, 
What about what happens when your win is gained off the backs of someone else's loss? Is the cross God's big win? Jesus loses his life on the cross. It's not the big win. And the temptation for us who want to be on the winning team, who want to just have the happy part, is to skip past the cross. Let's not worry too much about the cross and just head for the empty tomb. Easter's coming, Lent, we'll call that preparation for Easter. Easter's coming, and uh, let's just be about the resurrection. That'll be great. Let's just focus on that. That's the win. But the problem is, is that in the text, in the Bible, there's an insistence, an insistence that the people of Jesus are people of the cross first. And as we're doing that, we are simply trusting God for the new life that comes after death. We're not engineering that. We're not just manufacturing good vibes now so that we can hopefully draw a larger crowd. That's not being people of the cross. In the second chapter of Philippians, Paul talks about it this way. So if we skip back a couple of chap- uh, one chapter from what we were just reading, Paul writes, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient even to the point of death and even death on a cross. So to live as a follower of Jesus, to live a cruciform life, what we do is we we try to think the same way as Christ. We have the same mind as Christ, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard his God status as something to be used for his own advantage to be exploited, but he emptied himself. He became a slave. He even died as a servant and an awful death at that for the sake of that service. And so anytime we see the opposite of this mindset of Christ giving up his power to set others free, Anytime we see the opposite of that, we are seeing seeing something that is opposed to the cross of Christ. We are seeing someone behaving as an enemy of the cross of Christ. See, Jesus has all the power in the universe, and he did not regard that as something to be exploited or to be used for his own advantage, but he emptied himself. So anytime we see someone exploiting their own power, There we see someone behaving as an enemy of the cross of Christ. And in this passage, here's what Paul says about them, enemies of the cross of Christ. He says first, their end is destruction. That doesn't quite mean they will end up destroyed, although maybe end here just means goal, like toward that end, goal, or oriented towards. Another way of saying this might be they are bent on ruin. They leave destruction in their wake as they go. Other people are collateral damage to them. Then he says their God is the belly. This is maybe the most telling one for me. They see something, they want it, they take it. See, the God is is whatever it is that you serve, and their God is just whatever I want. For those opposed to the cross of Christ, it's the appetite. And he's not talking about just, you know, I want to have a good meal today, right? That's not what he's talking about. It's the craving for more and more, and no matter how much is eaten, the appetite continues. I will just see what I want, and I'll take it. And it doesn't matter the repercussions or who gets hurt. 
And then Paul says their glory is in their shame, or they revel in what is shameful. So they have abused, they have coerced, they have mocked, they have beaten, they have left a trail of damage behind, they have satisfied their appetite for more, they have taken what they wanted with no regard for anyone else, but more than that, they celebrate that they live that way. I can do whatever I want, and so I go ahead and do it, and I don't care about anybody else, and I glory in it. And Paul's conclusion is their minds are set on earthly things. And then he says, but our citizenship is in heaven. So he's playing off these two ways against one another, the cruciform life and the enemies of the cross of Christ. The enemies are set, have their minds set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. And some take this to mean that those who follow Jesus and do so rightly, that means we're not from here. Right? That some believe that, that essentially we are at odds with the world and ought to be just waiting to go to where we really belong. Let's just wait it out and then we'll go to heaven back to where we belong. But actually, what Paul is saying is almost the opposite of that. <laughs> yes, we, we belong to heaven, but he's, he's talking about that in a way that actually impacts and affects the way we live on earth, not as a way of just waiting until we escape from it. Uh, there's a particular word here for citizen, citizenship that gets translated as citizenship. It's polytuma. Um, and the root word of this, you'll hear polit, right? It's where we get English words like politics or police, policy. Uh, the word here is used to describe the state itself. So it gets translated citizenship, but it could be almost like our country is in heaven. It's it's about the state itself. But our English words that we have actually help us understand this better. Um, Not that many of us really like thinking too much about the police or policies or politics, to be sure. Like lots of people say, don't talk about politics in church. But, But actually, all of those things, they're not negative things. They are all about How are we going to organize society, right? Like, how are we going to manage our common life together? Of course, we're going to disagree about that. That's what ends up happening in politics, because it's a discussion about, should we organize our life this way or that way? Of course, we're going to disagree. But these words help us understand what Paul is talking about when he uses this word, polytuma. It's about kind of... This this way of being together. Some translations have this as, but our commonwealth is in heaven, right? Commonwealth is is another word that means country. I like this because it still means country. Like we live in a commonwealth in Canada. The country we belong to is heaven. It says that, but it also has this beautiful compound word in it of common and wealth. Not One person gaining wealth over another, but the gain of everyone in common is what is implied in that word, what is supposed to happen. Now, the King James Bible has an amazing translation of this. I don't often quote the King James, um, but it's very different than our modern translations. Listen to this. The King James says, but our conversation is in heaven. Our conversation, where did they get that from? Uh, Actually, in the 1600s, when the King James translation came out, the word conversation was used to talk about how a person conducted oneself and spoke as an upstanding member of their community. That's what conversation meant in the early 1600s. Isn't that interesting? But I kind of like that. It's so good. Our conversation is in heaven. So listen to this. Many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is the belly and their glory is their shame. But we are having a totally different conversation because our citizenship, our commonwealth, our politics, our policy is in heaven. And it is from there, Paul says, that we are expecting a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humiliation or our humble bodies that it may be conformed to the body of his glory. 
And again, some people think this is about Jesus coming and and pulling us out of this earth, taking us to heaven and transforming us into some new kind of form of our bodies that is now fit for the real place of our citizenship, right? Jesus is going to pull us out of heaven, transform our bodies so that we can actually live there properly. Uh, Could be. But notice the flow of the verse. The movement is actually not about us going to heaven. The movement is actually about Jesus coming from heaven to transform things on earth. It isn't about us moving to heaven. It's about Jesus coming from heaven. This is the same movement that is in the Lord's Prayer that Jesus taught. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth just as it is in heaven. Your will be done on earth. And then, but you might say, well, look, okay, our, fine. Our citizenship or our conversation is in heaven, but look around because it isn't working on earth, is it? It isn't working. This transformation isn't happening. There's war, there's hunger, there's sickness, there's unrest, there's political alienation, there's protests. It just isn't happening if you look around. And our faith actually just doubles down on this expectation of a savior. Think about Paul's context. All those things were true in his context too. Look around you. The Roman Empire is persecuting people all over the place, taking over land that doesn't belong to them. That's in Paul's context. He is looking around and he says, but you know what? Our citizenship is in heaven. And so... From there, we're expecting this Savior, and and he's going to transform our bodies or our physical reality. So what he's kind of saying is you can't disconnect your faith from the physical. You can't just disconnect into the spirit and say, well, okay, sure, there's bad things, but I'm just going to do some transcendental meditation, and I'll be one with the spiritual universe or whatever. No, no, no. Bodies of those who have been the collateral damage, the hurt ones, the broken ones, those bodies will be conformed to the body of his glory. True transformation. You see the the movement that is here? Just as Jesus' body was humiliated and suffered and died on the cross and then was transformed into a body of glory, so too are the suffering bodies of this world then conformed into that same glory when he comes. And Paul writes that Jesus will do this by the power that also enables him to make all things subject to himself, right? So it's not like Jesus just has one sphere of things that he's in. As though it's, well, yeah, God's up in heaven and we... We talk about Jesus in church. Okay, that's fine. No. All things, those who are broken, tired, hurting, those who are suffering because there are some who just take what they want when they want it and they don't care who gets hurt. Those who are suffering because of the enemies of the cross of Christ. Jesus will transform them. He'll transform their suffering bodies. And he'll do it by the power that also enables him to make all things subject to himself. All things. Not just the church. Not just people who say they believe in him. But everything. This one, this Jesus who walked a totally different way who rode a donkey into Jerusalem, who stooped down and washed his disciples' feet, right? This one who walked a a cruciform way and invites us along that same path. This one who did not regard his ultimate God power as something to be exploited, but 
emptied himself. This is the one who has all things given into his loving hands. And so, of course, of course, Paul wrote to start Philippians chapter 4, verse 1. Of course, then, because of this Jesus, who is this Savior, who is coming from the place where our citizenship is, the place where our true conversation happens. Of course, then, Paul writes, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. Amen.